Hello and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk About. And today we're talking about websites and SEO. And we've got Richard Ray from the line from West UK. Welcome, Richard. Hi, Richard. Um, Thanks for having me. No problem. As you can see, uh, during the time of recording, we're into Six Nations time. So hence the uh, England rugby jersey. Um, but uh, anyhow, Richard, I've got some questions for you about websites and SEO because I've seen some uh, posts and comments by people that clearly they don't know about these things. So we wanted mm -hmm. just to clarify a few things. And the three parts of websites that I think people get confused by, which I would just ask you to clarify, is the hosting of the website, the mm -hmm. platform on which the website's made, and who actually makes their website. Now, can you yeah. explain the difference between those three, and do you need to have them all done by the same person? Um, there's, yeah, there's three, like you said, there's three different areas to it. There's the person who builds the website, your web designer or developer, mm -hmm. um, or as is now the case, your website assembler. So you've got like a new level of person where you've got a developer, a designer, and then for one level underneath that, you've got an assembler. People like VAs and PAs who know how to put a, put a, a content management system and put some content into it. Um, so you've got the person who's actually managing or doing the website. <coughs> sorry. And then you've got the hosting platform, the, 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 sorry, the software platform that the website is, is created in. So that can be something like Joomla, WordPress, it could be um, Shopify. There's loads of different platforms and stuff out there. Um, Envision Powerboard is another good website uh, for com building communities. Um, so there's quite a lot of platforms to, to choose from. Uh, the choice, if you like, is endless. You could spend days and days and days just, it's like an Argos catalogue with a kid. You can spend days looking at it and not, not decide which one you want. Um, and then, of course, you've got the hosting platform that it's based on. And where where things get quite muddy, if you like, is the person who's building the website all too frequently is the person who takes on the role of middleman um, and gets a reseller account from somewhere else and they try to become your sort of hosting company, if you like. Um, so they, they, try and, they try and do all of the roles um, rather than just being an excellent designer or someone who's, who's extremely knowledgeable in content management systems, uh, they then try and take on that hosting role as well. And sometimes they come a bit unstuck when they get phone calls at one or two in the morning. Mm. Um, so there, there are three, there, there are two separate areas where any good designer and developer should know and understand all the content management systems that are out there because they all work pretty much the same way. You know, you've got your, your pages and your code and your database backend. Uh, so regardless of which platform you pick, whether it's Joomla, WordPress, Shopify, they're all, they're all basically the same. They all operate the same way. Um, so it's, it's, you know, you, you've got your designer, a content person, and your hosting platform that you choose to put it on. Um, but obviously there are, other plat there are some platforms where you can't necessarily choose your hosting platform. Um, for yeah. example, things like Wix and those kind of, those build it yourself um, options. When you actually build it yeah. on Wix, for example, you can't just then move to another host. You're kind of stuck with using Wix. No, that's right. That's right. Wix, Squarespace. And also if you choose, if you choose the WordPress software, you've got two options. You can either host it at WordPress itself, or you can do what they call a self-hosted version, where you pick your own hosting platform and host it there. But if you go with WordPress.com, uh, you will end up wherever WordPress put your put your websites. Mm. So, for instance, uh, with Wix, it all ends up on Google servers in California. Squarespace, it all ends up in New York. Um, so you don't, like you say, you don't get to choose where it is, mm. um, which which can lead to quite a disadvantage to your competitors. So, so as a as a business owner, I mean, I'm probably talking more about smaller businesses, but Actually, if you make the right decisions, you can have control over where your website's hosted, also um, what it's made with and who makes it. Because obviously, if you're going to go out and get a developer to make a website for you, or even a VA to just to populate a website, uh, use a standard template of sorts, um, you obviously need to consider, A, who are you, um, how, 
who do you want to make it and what do they specialize in? Or alternatively, I find with WordPress, you get the majority of developers are quite used to WordPress and it's one of the most popular um, platforms. Mm. That's why I opted for that. But then, as you say, if you, if you take control of the hosting, you can then choose where you host it. And also Indeed. the other thing that we haven't even mentioned are domain names. So many people aren't, so many businesses aren't in control of their own domain name. I mean, that, do you find that often that to me would be something I as a business owner would insist on having control over? Yeah, it is. It is quite a common case that comes up where you'll find that the person who built the website, the, the business owner quite often just gets them to do it all for them just because they don't understand it all. So it's not, out of, it's often, it's not out of anything malicious from the designer or developer. It's just the business owner saying, well, I don't, ha I don't know how any of this works. Just, can you just buy the name for me and take care of it? Um, that, that's pretty much the case most of the time. And then often what happens is that's really not the ideal situation because then what happens later is if the customer, as they learn and grow with their business and their website and they discover, or as has been the case before, something happens to the website designer or developer be it they get bored and want to go back to work or change careers or whatever they disappear off the scene can't be contacted and now the business owner can't take back ownership of the domain name uh, because it was registered by one person <coughs> and because it was registered in another company's uh, website so for instance you might have your website developer register a domain name in their account at 123 Reg or Fastface or wherever. So your domain name is in someone else's account, a, a hosting company, as opposed to being in your account with the hosting company. Mm -hmm. So developer goes bye-bye and never heard of for a, while, for a long time. And then obviously when the customer decides to find another developer or designer to replace them, the first question they're going to say is, well, where's your domain name? And then obviously they, the person's uncontactable and the hosting company of, of the, the original developer won't talk to them. Mm. Um, so that can be quite, that can be a problem. It, it causes a lot of problems that a business owner probably wouldn't even know would exist until it's too late. Yeah. Oh, that was one of the advantages when I wanted to move my hosting across to you because I had control of the domains. I could just simply pick up the domains, move them across to your hosting mm. and mm. carry on as if nothing happened. But had, yeah. had I not had control of those domains, that would have been a, a massive issue. And mm. I think I, I come across quite a few people asking about websites. And, that, and when I say to them, do you have control of your domains? They don't even know what I'm talking about. And I think that, yeah, that's, that's one the of the most dangerous next. things. Mm. <clears throat> and, it, and it is quite a technical thing for a lot of business owners that they don't, they don't know about it. But it is quite worrying when you discover how it works. And then you discover that you're probably the only one who's actually doing it in a way that's protecting yourself and no one else is so that well hold on a minute mm. what are they doing because like i say a lot of these de designers and developers they're not domain registrars they're not you know they're not governed by nominet they're just buying domain names at, at another company just like any joe blogs would um, and it's just sitting in their account where they might have 50 or 100 domain names belonging to all sorts of customers that they built websites for and if something happens to them or they don't pay a bill um, even something simple like if their credit card gets declined and they don't pay the renewal costs, that's enough to take down your domain name. Uh, if they don't act on it, uh, I mean, we've had it before where we've had customers ring up and say, my website went down a week ago, what's going on? And you, and you sort of look and you say, well, your domain name is not registered with us. And you look it up and see, well, your domain name is at such and such a company and it expired a month ago. And they go, what, really? <laughs> and they have to go... Mm -hmm in panic mode and start trying to renew their domain name, you know? Uh, well, I, I, had, I, had something sim I had something similar with one of the previous places we were hosting. Uh, I think they forgot to renew my renewal. And then mm. all of a sudden, the, the place where they were renewing my renewal then wanted to start charge hefty penalties to get the renewal <laughs> back again. Yeah. Um, and actually now, <coughs> since being with you, I mean, I opened an account. I buy the domains through your website, but I'm, I own them. Yeah. And then you host them. And I think the four questions I would ask any person who's, who's got a website, who's got control of the domains, who mm. made the website, where is it hosted, and what mm. platform is it on? And yeah. those are the, if you want to change any one of those things, those are the first, those are four of the questions people are going to ask you. 
And I mm. found that the vast majority of people I come across don't know at least one of those answers, if not many of them. Well, yeah, most of the people I speak to can't answer three of those. Uh, yeah. They know they know who who made the website happen, and that's it. Anything beyond that, they're just sort of you know goes over their head. Yeah, I uh, think I think that that is that is the scary thing. But it's not through ignorance. And most of the time, it's just through not having the time to learn these things. You know, they just they just know they want a website, and someone says they can make it happen, and they go, "Okay, off you go." Um, they just, they just most people just don't have the time to sit and learn all that stuff because it's. I think it can be frightening as well because it to mo to most business owners it probably feels like a a very technical um, and, a, and a humongous learning curve. Um, mm. But I said, like like you found when you but once you start getting into it, actually, it is quite simple. Um, but it, but it probably feels like something that's quite scary to a lot of business owners. Because also, I mean, I, I mean, I made my own website, as as you know, and I mm. obviously know where it's hosted, and I know uh, I've got access to the domain name, and all the rest of it. So there's no kind of there's no <laughs> doubt as to who owns that website. But the problem yeah. is when you when you go onto Wix or something, do you actually own the website? Do Wix own that website? Because uh, even from a point of view of ownership of the website, they've got control of it. They they can they can chop <coughs> and change and do what they want, and you have very little say mm. about that. Whereas yeah. when you've actually got control of all four of those aspects, uh, mm. you've far more in control, and you actually own that website rather than because sometimes <coughs> I I wonder. I mean, people say to me, well, they they got someone to make it for them. They don't know where the domain is. They don't know who's got that domain. And actually, I go, mm. well, do you own your website or do they own yeah. your website? I think at the end yeah, of the it day, is quite a design. unique problem because <laughs> if you take, for example, Wix and Squarespace, they're pretty much identical in the way they operate and what they do and what they're selling. Uh, it's a te they're a template licensing company. And that's it. They're not a hosting mm. company. They're not a registrar. Uh, they're just a template licensing company. And what you're buying with them is you're buying rental access to their templates. Uh, and then you put, because it's all custom made for them, this is where the lock-in happens. Um, everything that's made for them, you put your, you, put, you spend a lot of time putting your content into their system. And if you haven't got a copy of that, if you just, and I've discovered a lot of people do this, they sit and write out their website, but they're writing it off the top of their head. Mm. So they haven't got a copy of it. And then like a year later, when they discover the limits of what those platforms uh, can do, when they want to take them somewhere else, there's no export function. It's not like a poster in a shop window. You can't just take it down, take it to another shop. Every piece of content that you put into those templates, that's it. It's a, it's a lock-in, basically. Um, if you want to go anywhere else, you've got to start again. And like you say, because uh, well, well, Wix hosts their stuff on Google servers in California, but when you look at the source code, it's a mishmash of about four or five different platforms all pulling together from all over the place. Um, I mean, the average Wix homepage is about 7,000 lines of code. And that's if you just have one paragraph and one picture. Mm. Whereas the average WordPress website is less than 1,000 for you know, two full pages of text. Um, it's, it's just a hell of a lot more efficient platform. But like because of the Wix and Squarespace software, is tied into their their platforms you can't take that website with you mm. like in the same way if you was to sit and write a html page and upload it you can take that html page to any web hosting company in the world upload it to the server and away you go uh, or with wordpress the self-hosting you, know, you can take your wordpress software and just shuffle it around wherever you like put it on whatever hosting company you want uh, you know, there's no new, no requirement to start again from scratch. What you've yeah. built is yours, and you can take it wherever you like. <clears throat> Whereas with the custom-built solutions, what you put into their system, that's it. That's that's where it's going to go, and that's where it's going to end up. Uh, yeah. There's no. Well, and because well, even if they right? had an export facility, you still couldn't take it anywhere because no one would right? have an import facility for that stuff. Yeah. Because it's all custom made for them. No, so all you'd end exactly. up with is a backup of something you can still only use in one place. So that's the that's you know it's quite restricting in that respect. I mean it's and what a lot of people don't realise is that the sort of system that you're using, WordPress, if you add on something like uh, there's a really good plugin for it called Elementor. Mm -hmm. 
uh, if you add that to it, then you've effectively got the same system. And you spent like a third of the money. Um, but then, like you say, you get the advantage of being able to put it anywhere you like. Mm. Well, let's, let's talk about <coughs> another buzzword that a lot of people are on about that very few people actually fully understand, and that is SEO. Mm. What is SEO? I mean, I know it's a vast topic, but very simply put, what mm. would you say SEO is? It's a, proceed, it's a process, really. Um, it's, it's about getting your website ranked as highly in as many search engines as possible for the sort of search terms that you want people to find you by. Um, and it's, it's, that's really all there is to it. It's, it's, you know, a lot of people will tell you all lots and lots and lots of information mm-hmm. about what SEO is, but that's really all it boils down to, the nuts and bolts of when someone searches for something that you've got, how far up the search rankings do you come? That's pretty much all this. Because when when I when I first started my website, I didn't really know what it was, and I researched it to find out. And actually, before I understood what SEO was, I <laughs> I had in my mind, um, how does Google and the other search engine how do they understand a website in order to know what you've got? So surely mm. you need to lay this out in such a way that would would be beneficial to search engines, and they would understand mm. what you've got there, and. I thought that and I went and actually looked that up and then discovered that is what SEO was because I, I didn't know what it was when I first started. And, and actually, this is what I, I don't really understand is there's so many people out there offering SEO that don't yeah. actually make your website. Now, yeah. surely whoever's developing your website has, is by default doing SEO anyway. Surely it would help to have the person who's making your website as the person who's doing the SEO rather than having them as two separate people because then you basically, you've got mm. one person making it and then someone else then rejigging it for SEO. You, you're talking about an ideal world there, Rich. Um, no, I, I know I am, yes. In, in an ideal world, that would be, that would be glorious. Um, sadly, you, and this is where the third category of website person has come along in the last sort of five to ten years. The whole website assembler, the person mm. who's not a developer, they're not a designer, <laughs> They're just an assembler, like a production line in a, in a car factory. They don't make the parts, they just put them together. Mm. Um, quite often, like you say, the problem is that these people, they'll, they'll take the client's content and because they're offering to build websites for next to nothing, they'll just go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do your website for 100 quid, 50 quid or whatever, uh, throw up a, you know, spit out a WordPress website and install the customer's content. There you go, it's all done. There's very little thought in that goes into things like structure, content, um, how much of the content is relevant to what what the customers, um, what their clients' customers are going to be searching for. Mm. They just literally copy, paste, done. Thank you very much. Um, and and it is a shame. There's a lot of people that I've seen as well that will claim to build SEO complete websites, and when you look at them, they're a mess. Um, there's not even so much as you know the ratio of keywords and how it's written and they won't advise I mean I've had customers send send us stuff to put on their websites before and you say and you have to go back to the customer and say I'm really sorry but this is not this is not website worthy it either needs to be rewritten or you need to adjust what you're putting on the website because this will cost you dearly Mm. but a lot of people won't do that they'll just say okay cool and slap it on the website and Thank you very much. Pay up. Uh, it's, it's, one of, it's one of those things, unfortunately, isn't it, that you don't, it's not like when you, when you buy a new computer and you open the box and you look at it and go, wow, that looks really cool. <coughs> uh, SEO is one of those things that you only really notice down the line and it's all kind of under the engine type works. And actually, yeah. if, if you as a business owner don't know what, you look, don't know what it is, hence the fact mm. that you're getting someone to do it for you, I mean, you're only going to know six months down the line if you look at if you look at what they said they would achieve and they haven't achieved it yet. Yeah. Or a year down the line or whatever it might be. Then only do you look at it and go, well, something's not right here. But yeah. by then you've paid them a load of money. So it's 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 a tricky thing to monitor, and that's what I think opens it up to all the the experts <coughs> who know all the stuff about it to actually come out the woodwork and go, yeah, we do SEO because mm-hmm. people know it's necessary. They want to spend money on it. But they mm. don't actually know what's being done. Indeed, and this and the other downside to it as well is a lot of a lot of SEO experts, uh, the genuine ones, are expensive. 
you know, you're looking at a four figure sum of money every per month mm. to get, there's quite a few levels of SEO uh, people out there. That, I mean, I would class myself as a, as a sort of somewhere in the middle between the hardcore SEO experts who do nothing but that all day and the people who build the websites that are SEO friendly. So mm. you've got on-site SEO, which is the, the search engine work that's done on your website, and then the off-site SEO, the stuff that's done elsewhere on, online. Uh, to promote your website to the search engines and you know the hardcore guys do nothing but that all day long they don't build websites they just fix websites and 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 take care of the rankings for them um so i would class myself as a somewhere like an intermediate if you like mm. i don't get involved with the really hardcore stuff um, but i go way beyond just the basics um and some of the the, the problem was with a lot of it is a lot of the people who don't do it very well or do it right, they will try and charge those four figure sums of money up front. Mm. Uh, they don't offer any sort of, how can I put it? They don't offer any gradual step into the process. Uh, I mean, this is one of the things we've started doing now is offering a gradual step in process where we can explain it to you, show you what's happening. And then for, you know, just small monthly payments, I mean, very small. You can test the waters. So you can say, okay, I'll give that guy 50 quid a month to see here's what he's going to do. Um, and then when he does that and I can see the results from it, I might give him another 50 quid. Or I might, you know, if I see after three months that it is starting to work, I might up the money. Mm. So instead of saying, give me a thousand pound a month and here's what we do, actually, we sort of say, well, let's start out with one or two hours work a month to get your website in the right shape. Um, and then once people start to see the benefits of that over sort of three to six months, then they can say, okay, well, I can see where this is going now and I understand it. Um, so you make it, um, you try and make it a much more gradual process so mm. people don't feel so panicky about some more. I don't want to give someone a thousand pound a month for something even I don't understand. Because right. it's not just about your website, is it? It's about your marketing in general. So your all your social media and everything comes into play. And I well, think this your is... SEO, your mm. SEO is a part of your marketing. Yeah. Where your market, whereas your marketing wouldn't be part of your SEO. Well, but yeah, but your SEO being part of your marketing, it's pointless having mm. it's pointless having one plan for your SEO and another plan for your marketing. Those two need to tie oh, yeah. up. And they Absolutely. need to tie up with your social media. So actually, mm. if you look at your website as well as your SEO, it should be part of your whole marketing campaign. Yeah. It's not just a case Absolutely. of, okay, I've got a website, I've got a Facebook account, I've got Twitter, I've got whatever, let's just post mm. random stuff in all of them. Those all need to tie up. Absolutely. Yeah, so your SEO would tie in with things like, if you had a company, say you were doing leaflet deliveries, posters on buses or whatever, mm. um, promotional websites and, and other other things like that your seo for your website would be part of that bigger plan um and i think that's where a lot of website owners can get mud, muddy waters from or mixed signals from you know as experts where they're made to believe maybe that seo is the be all and end all of the marketing mm. just do seo that's all you need it's like well it's not you know it's, it's part of the bigger picture and also, I think we need to be realistic about what we expect from SEO as well, because mm. I, I get a lot of, I get an almost weekly email from someone somewhere in you know, some obscure corner of the globe. Well, you get those too, huh? <laughs> yeah, offering, offering to do my SEO and get me to number one on Google for my preferred search term. And I, I, I kind of think, well, do I want to be number one on Google for my, my preferred search term? Uh, and sometimes I think, well, actually, no. I mean, I'm a small business. Um, cause I had one the other day saying we can get you a thousand leads a week. And I thought, well, how do you, how do you guarantee that first of all? And second of all, I don't want a thousand leads a week. Um, I want a thousand a day to answer the phone, is there? <laughs> no, I want five leads a week and yeah. I want those to be quality <coughs> leads. I don't yeah. want a whole bunch of tire kickers phoning 25 times a day for stupid things. Mm. And, and sometimes I think we, we, we go for that. Uh, they're promising this, they're promising that. Actually, I, I would say a good SEO person, when you approach them, they will say to you, what are you trying to achieve? What do you want to do? How, you mm. know, what? And they're going to actually come back at you with a lot of questions. Because if mm. they don't, I question as to whether they're actually any good. Because how do mm. they know what to do unless they understand what you as a business owner, 
are trying mm. to achieve through that. Um, well, they've got to understand the hook as well. There's mm. no, you know, I, I wouldn't, and I'm having this um, discussion with a customer right now on a, on a website that's about, to, that's about ready to go live now. And we're going to be starting the SEO work on it. And it was supposed to go live in November. But it's taken an extra three months to explain everything to the customer and make sure that they understand it, they're happy with it and comfortable with it, and understand the reasons behind why we're going to jumble all their text around and change everything that they love, they've loved for five years as their rankings have plummeted. I mean, they were getting 7,000, you know, so it's a hotel. They were getting 7,000 some visit, unique visits a month. And now they're down to about 600 at the most. So their rankings, they, you know, their unique visits have plummeted. Uh, I mean, there's other factors for that, with, you know, things like booking.com and hotels and whatnot. Mm. Um, but the fact that their rankings have plummeted, and when you try and say to them, well, is it really wise to have five sentences on your homepage that all say the same thing in a completely jumbled order? Is it wise to have four pages of local tourist attractions that all link off to every business in the whole neighborhood because now a search engine is going to think that you're just a business directory and not a hotel? Mm. Um, and it takes a while to explain. You know, a, a good person who's got the customer's interests at heart will take the time to explain that. And sometimes I've had arguments with customers over it, you know, where the customers, no, I want it to look rubbish. And you're like, well, no, I want it to look good. And then you sort of well, hold on a minute. Whose website is this? <laughs> because also, I mean, you, you talk about hit. You you know, um, just before the Rugby World Cup, I was I was upping my bandwidth something chronic because I had, I had my website was just viciously attacked by rugby fans all over the world because I, <laughs> because I yeah I had they a, formed a scrum around your website right yeah I mean I had a free Rugby World Cup uh, spreadsheet uh, that people could download and the, my hits just went absolutely crazy they were loving and, that weren't they but yet did that up my inquiries by this the same percentage the answer is no it didn't so mm. actually well, I was meaning to ask you that actually did it, it did it have any sort it, of fruits it, of your labor it did, it did have some effect there were a few people that came back to me from that saying listen you know we see what you've done for the rugby can you do something for our business and the answer was yes mm -hmm. so it did it did what it was there to do and it created awareness cool. and all the rest of it but i mean if if i if i normally have say a hundred hits a day and during that time i had a thousand hits a day my inquiries didn't go up tenfold put it that way right so actually it wasn't proportional to the amount of the amount it of wasn't traffic proportional it was so really hits to your website doesn't necessarily mean more business it no. depends why they're coming and actually exactly. that to that to me is a more important aspect of <laughs> Of, of SEO am I getting the right people coming to my website mm. because let's be honest if you just want people coming to your website there are ways to do that that yeah. aren't necessarily going to generate business and well there's automated bots for that all day long yeah um, and and also so that to, that to me is important thing so yeah I mean what I want to ask you just as a final question is what what have we learned from this and what what can we leave business owners with if, if you're a business owner and you're looking to get on top of your website you're looking to get a new one or get your first one or whatever the case might be what what are what are the things to consider and what, what do we, how do we start off what do we look for uh, well this is, is it's quite a that's a difficult question to answer in a very short yeah. Um, you couldn't put it into a sentence, put it that way. No. no. Um, but essentially, if I could nail it down to a few tips, is um, whoever you decide to go with to build your website, take a look at their portfolio. Don't be afraid to call their customers and say, "Hey, so and so built your website. How are you getting on with it? Have you have you had any problems? And and how was the process? Because the process is just as important as the end result. Mm. There's no good having a great website if it felt like a complete battle to get there." Um, and you know you want you want to work with a designer or a developer or an assembler who can explain the process as you go along, so that you understand what's being done and why. Um, and don't be afraid to ask two, three, four, five people. Some people often just you know ring up and go with the first person who says I'll do it for two hundred quid. And they're, All right then, and that's it. And they don't ask around. Um, <clears throat> so don't be afraid to check out whoever's offering, making you the offer, shop around for some quotes, and check out their portfolio. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and speak to people they've worked for. Um, one of the other things as well is if you're a designer, 
the good ones will have enough integrity to say, okay, I'll build the website for you. Uh, where would you like it hosted? And obviously they would recommend that you host it as close to your target audience as possible. Mm. That would be the, the, the ideal scenario. So if you're a target in the U S for example, if you've got an international product, they, that designer should say, well, actually I know a few good hosting companies in the U S I'll pick one and then I'll help you sign up for it. That would be the ideal scenario rather than them say, well, I'll sign up for it. Don't worry. I'll take care of the whole thing because then you've got to pay them and they got to pay the hosting company. And you're introducing what, what we'll call a single point of failure. Mm. It's like if we, if we took all the power supplies out of our servers and just had one power supply in every server, if that one power supply fails, the whole server goes down. Uh, so the cust- the owner of the website would ideally be the customer to the hosting company. Um, and then, you know, let the designer do what they're good at. And if they want to recommend a really good hosting company, that's, that's awesome. Um, but that single middle point of failure is, is the sort of thing that can, can get you in a pickle if it, if it goes a bit pear shaped or if you find along the way, you know, you and the designer, you're just not getting along. Uh, people, people have differences. Um, not everyone's going to get along. And if you say, okay, look, you know what? I want to call it a day and go and do your thing. Sometimes you've I've seen in the past where, um, someone's called it a day with a designer halfway through a project and everything that design has done, they've locked the customer out where they've gone, okay, stuff you then, if you're going to fire me, I'll, I'll keep everything I've done. So they might've paid, you know, they might've spent 50% of the budget on what they've got so far. And now they can't access anything. So you end up with that sort of lockout scenario again. So it's, it's a good idea to avoid that just by saying, well, I'll go to the hosting company and I'll give access to my hosting to my designer at the time. Um, and then if things go pear shaped, you can just shut the door and say, okay, find another designer to come on in and finish the project. Um, <coughs> and the other one is to, if you're going to buy your domain name, put some thought into it. Um, I'm sure you've seen this many times as well is, is people say, uh, and my window cleaner is guilty of this. He's got a domain name that's this long. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you wouldn't want to send him an email because it's quicker just to phone him up. Um, you know, give it some thought and mull it over. A good domain name can take anywhere from a few days to a few months to, to come up with. Um, you know, it, it really does take some thought and ask around, ask other businesses. What do you think of this domain name? Um, when you pick a domain name, try not to limit yourself to anything that's either a place or a date or an event. If you pick something, a domain name based on a date, a place or an event, you're tying yourself down. Unless, of course, the domain name of the website is for the London Olympics or whatever. Um, so that's really the, the best sort of advice I could give people is to say that pick a domain name that doesn't restrict you to a location, a date or a time. Be your own customer at the hosting company and get your website in the best place possible as close to your customers. And check out your developer, designer or, or website assembler and just make sure that they, you know, if they say they can do something, don't be afraid to ask and say, Hey, this is what they've offered me. Is that, mm. did you find that they were okay to work with? Did you get along with them? Uh, you know, cause a good designer, developer, whatever, won't be afraid to turn around and say to the customer, now hold on a minute. I know that's what you want, but that's not really going to work very well. They won't be afraid to come back at you and sort of not yeah. challenge you, but sort of steer you in the right direction with your ideas and make sure that you're not going off the beaten track. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same for me when, I'm, when I make spreadsheets for people. People come to me with one thing and say, this is what we want. And I'll say, well, are you sure? Because it will work better if you do it like this. And I yeah. think any, any, if you're going to a professional for anything, they mm. should know more than you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be necessarily be going to them. Well, yeah. You so, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm open to advice from whoever I'm going to for services because obviously they know more about it than I do. Mm. Because the other thing as well is is having access to your website. I know a lot of people who, 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 when they want to make a simple change to their website, they've got to go back to the designer to now pay yeah. extra to do a simple change. Whereas I've obviously got complete control of mine. So, I mean, I, yeah. I update my website almost daily. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the options we give people when we, when, before we even start, you know, so much as lift a mouse. It's okay. Where do you want to go with it once it's finished? would you like us to teach you how to use it so that you can look after it yourself? Or would you like us to do it for you in case you're either not inclined to do it, don't want to do it, or just have the time? Because some people might have the time, but they go, oh, no, I don't understand it all. 
but actually with a few hours of tuition and you sort of show them around and they can get to grips with it really quickly. But as long as you make all those options available right from the start mm -hmm. and be very open with your customers and say, look, we can build something for you that you can, we can then teach you how to use and then sort of have a graduated sort of transition period where we do everything and then gradually moves into us teaching you how to do it. Or if you know how to do it already, we can just build it for you and you can crack on with it. But as long as they know what they're getting into from the start, that's really the important part. Well, I think it's, it's all about open, openness <coughs> and transparency with, with this and understanding what mm. all the different stages are. And, and it, yeah. I mean, because it sounds to me, I think, to, to, for people to take away is that getting a website isn't just a five minute job of phone someone to get one. There are a lot of things to consider. If only it was, eh? <laughs> if only. I mean, even as someone, who's, <coughs> as someone who's changed the domain name halfway through a business, I can tell you it is not an easy task. Uh, it, you can switch hosts. You can often even switch platforms. You can change web designers. You can, mm. I've changed my website completely. And that is a lot easier than changing a domain. All yeah. your marketing, all everything, all has to change. And it's a right pain. And you really want to get that right from the word go. Mm. Um, well, yeah, so there's another one. There's the customer that's coming on at the moment. They've just come on board a month ago. And they're just in the stage at the moment where everything they're targeting is UK but they're using a .com domain name. And because their website was, up until a month ago, sat on a GoDaddy server, 92% of their traffic was coming from the States. Mm. They're wasting all their monthly, monthly money and website resources delivering a website to people that they don't want to sell to. And when I showed them this, I said, well, why are you using a .com? Oh, well, we just prefer a .com. Okay, but if you combine the .com, with the location of the website, that's why you're getting such a high traffic rate for the US. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, you've got to sort of sow the seed to say, okay, don't do it now, but at some point, we need to address the fact that your website was and has been targeting the US audience. Um, and it's worth considering either switching it to a .co.uk if you do it in a structured way and do it properly. Uh, because like you say, it is a pain in the neck. Um, so you've got to give it a lot of thought and look at everything that can possibly go wrong before you even so much as click a button. Uh, and because otherwise, if you keep the .com and, and put it in the UK, it can work. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a .com in the right place, but you've got to work out how you market it. Uh, so it'll be part of your bigger marketing picture. And we've got customers who use .coms in the UK and they're doing very well. Um, but their domain names are a lot more appropriate and, and up, there's a lot of other factors going on. Yeah. So. All right. Well, we have gone well over time discussing this, but it's been fascinating. <coughs> so Richard, thank you very much for your time. Well, should we that long already? Wow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I hope that people have learned something because I think this is a, this is a topic that a lot of people think that they know about and they actually don't. So hopefully they can take something away from this. Yeah. And, I hope uh, so. Yeah. Always happy to talk about this sort of stuff all day long. So if anyone wants to speak geek, as it were, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sure they would. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, we can get some people on track with their websites. But yeah, thank you very much, Richard, for your time. You're very welcome. <laughs>